Welcome back to Part of the Mess, a podcast about humorous, inspirational, and educational experiences presented by first-time moms trying to navigate parenthood and staying sane doing it. I am your host, Brittany, and today I'm joined by Jessica. Hey. And Cody. Howdy. This is episode 14, and today, after catching up with you, we're going to talk about kids and pets. But before we jump in uh, to catching up with you, I want to remind you guys about we have some awesome bonus content. We just had some great today I learned moments about all of us. So actually, I don't I don't know if I shared anything juicy. I can't remember. Oh, band camp. That's, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So that was just a little sneak peek for you there's more where that came from if you go to the dance with me anyway so all right so Cody do you want to go ahead and uh, kick us off with catching up yeah so um I don't know if I talked about Emmett learning words or not in a catch-up section recently I talked about it somewhere oh yeah that he kicked off with all these words yeah it was a couple weeks ago yeah so he's still he's still learning a good amount of words he he's probably up to like 10 or 15 um but something weird that happened is he started saying d's for b's so instead of book he would say because he used to say bo 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 when he wanted to do a book now he says do 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 and instead of ball he'll say do as well there's there's a there's just a few words that he doesn't say b's anymore and it's so weird um but i talked to a friend of mine that's a speech pathologist and she said it it's probably nothing to worry about you should definitely should not worry about it right now just keep repeating bees and he'll probably learn it but it's so scary to see your child get something and then them lose it yeah that was i was like oh what is going on that's totally totally valid to be in apprehensive about that especially when there's so many different timelines like people always say you don't need to worry mm-hmm. about this or that until this age but I've never heard anybody say but if they stop doing this you know like when Buddy and Swiss would repeat us sometimes and then other times they would just stare at us blankly and I'm like well that's it <laughs> we know we can diagnose them now that's the sure sign of whatever you know like pull out the first first year medical student syndrome yeah. manual you know yeah. like anything anything that I've ever heard of I'm like well that's a sure sign of but and Phil's always like I think that they're just fine and I'm like you don't know anything but what if but what if it's, what yeah, if it's a tumor yeah. have you guys watched any like done any research or watched any videos on anything like that like I found myself I don't know down the rabbit hole of YouTube watching videos like signs that your baby has autism and stuff like that or like seizures things like that because because jamie used to have really weird breathing things um that were to do with his silent reflux and i was like what if he's like having a seizure or something and i don't even know so i ended up watching videos of like babies having seizures and stuff and thank goodness that was not it I bet that was still scary to watch those videos. You're like, oh, so that scary thing is not what this scary thing is. And people are hesitant. Sure. They're not as many. And I, I get the idea that, like, you don't necessarily want to sit and film your child when they're choking or having a seizure or something. But it is really helpful to see what it looks like mm-hmm. so you're not, like, wondering, you know, especially when they're eating solids and you're like, what's the difference between gagging and choking? There is yeah. a pretty sure. fine line. Yeah. So but, helpful. Yeah. I think I've been hyper aware too, because have you guys seen the Instagram account Stars for Stevie by chance? Uh, that sounds familiar. Well, it's on Facebook, actually. Yeah, probably. So my brother's wife's brother, his daughter got diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor, and 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 so I've been kind of following along her journey. It's terminal. She's got a terminal form of cancer. Aww. And I think because of that, I've been hyper aware of just any differences and any regression is so scary to me because from what I've read, it was like she was a totally fine little three-year-old girl, happy, progressing, um, neurotypical, and then boom, out of nowhere, her, uh, I think it was her motor skills just started declining at a rapid rate and they were like what is this days and they took her to the hospital and got this brain tumor and so I'm like oh my gosh this could be my kid you know this could be my kid and I am not vigilant with that one thing and then I lose him you know what I mean I I just ah there's moments of panic like that I didn't want to mention this a minute ago 
but you brought up that, so I will say this. But my uh, my former job before I worked as a uh, case manager and outpatient mental health was uh, doing in home. I don't know the technical name for it, but it was in home autism therapy, and I was no good. I mean, I I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but I wasn't able to really connect. So I did it just a short time, six months. But the information was so helpful. Anyway, that's not why I brought it up. But what I was going to say was that I worked with this little boy whose story was similar to what we're talking about. Like, he was a normal little boy, and then at two years old, he started regressing. Mm -hmm. And so anything that I see, especially with Buddy, I'm like, well, he probably has autism, which as a note, I don't, I got to remind myself that's not a death sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many, there's high functioning all the way down to whatever, you know, like, and so I just keep reminding myself that, that that's, you can have a fine life and still be on the spectrum, which we know isn't li- linear. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, every which direction. And, and we all probably have, we're all probably on the spectrum, whatever, you know. And so it it's good to remember that. But I just remember this mother being so confused like that. And, you know, she, mm-hmm. he was, I think, five when I started working with him. And this was like, I don't know, over half a decade ago. But it was just, it's something that's really stood out to me. And so every time, oh, and then another little boy that I worked with, he was very, very delayed. He was, he seemed super cute, super normal, but he really struggled talking and people would say, oh, he talks, but he really just repeats everything. It's just so echoic. Mm-hmm. And he would, you'd say, say this. And he would say that and they'd be like, yay, but he's not saying anything. You know, he'd say like, repeat what I just said. And he's like, repeat what I just said. So called it's called echolalia yes that's what it is yeah Mm -hmm. and that's I know normal when they're in stages of like one and two maybe up to three but not necessarily up to like four and five and so I definitely think it's intimidating to be a parent and and to not know and it's really easy to do things like Jess and I would have talked about looking at the future and I don't know so much about you Jess but I know for me and I've told you this that I'm like well what about when they're a teenager and this happens I've got to make my game plan mm-hmm. <laughs> you know because nothing will change between then so yeah I I struggle with what we're talking about you know mm-hmm. for sure I'm sorry that that's the case, but I'm glad that you had hopefully some solace in talking to your friend. Yeah, for sure. And I think I'll just, I have to talk myself down sometimes and say, okay, no one has brought up that this should be a cause for concern. We'll wait till his appointment, his next pediatric appointment. And then if there's, you know, we'll, we'll take it one step at a time because otherwise I just spin out and I get scared. That's my that's my catch up because that's all that's been going on in my I life. I hope I hope it goes well for you. We we had a bit of a scare today, uh, which is my catch up. So Jamie is five months now and he is much stronger and wanting to move a lot, even though he's not really rolling over. He did roll over. He he's rolled over a couple of times with like severe uh assistance, <laughs> like motivating him and trying to get him to, you know move to what the point where he can just kind of fall. And then, um, the other day I wasn't doing anything at all, but he was kind of laying on top of some things. So he wasn't quite flat on the ground. So he rolled over on his own and I still think it was an accident. Um, so he's like not really moving on purpose in that way, but he is moving his arms and legs a lot and he's kind of rotating a lot and, um, he loves to sit and stand. And so today TJ had him next to him on the couch in a sitting position and we have this table that I have my computer on right now um, up in front of the couch. And apparently in just a a second, Jamie went from a sitting position to a standing position. Like he Mm. stood himself up and then he, he arched his back and then went to like correct himself and then fell forward and hit his head on the table. So he has a a little bit of a bump on his forehead. Yeah. It's, it's not super swollen. It just, it'll probably bruise, but it's just like his first real (laughs) boo-boo and it was so sad. And apparently he wasn't too upset about like TJ said he cried for a little bit, like maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds to a a minute or so. And then he calmed down and he seemed completely fine. But it was just so crazy to me that at five months old, he just like from sitting to standing all by himself. And then, yeah, it's totally crazy. So, well, he is an Olympian in the making. Yeah. yeah. Unless the sport is rolling over and then. (laughs) And he's made it. Oh, 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 no, No. then he hasn't. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. 
No, I think he's going to be pretty strong. Like when we put him down on his stomach, he he likes to turn around, like rotate around. And he also likes to bring his legs up and then kind of scoot. So he's, I feel like he's closer to crawling than rolling over, but I'm sure it'll just happen one day. He'll just, he'll get it and he'll start doing it. But we've been trying, we've been working with him on it for like two months now and there's been nothing. (laughs) Well, if it's any comfort, like we had some things that we'd work on for a long time and I hate to say that we pretty much gave up because we probably shouldn't have, because especially with my recent posts on um, social media about repetition being so like just then out of nowhere, they do stuff. But I've, you know, had plenty of that with, with Buddy and Swiss where we work on it for a while and I'm like, she'll never walk. So. What What's most, what's been most annoying about the rolling over is I work with him on this like every single day. We do tummy time every day with clothes and the diaper on and we also do naked tummy time. Um, to remove all restrictions and everything. And like, I work with him a lot. And then my sister comes in who only sees him maybe once a day for five or 10 minutes or something. She'll just come in and she'll be playing with him. So I'll go and do something, you know, like go to the bathroom or fold clothes or whatever, because she's watching him and she'll get him to roll over. It it happened twice. (laughs) And then finally, like I said the other day, he rolled over with me and I was like, well, it was still an accident, but at least it was with me. (laughs) It's something. (laughs) It's not me. I claim this. So annoying. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, I believe it'll come. He's so advanced (laughs) that there's no way, or maybe he's just like, I got to slow this down. I got to be careful. I think sometimes it's just a decision. Sometimes yeah. it's not that they're not like capable of doing it. They're like, I don't enjoy this. And then something clicks. And yeah. Like, oh, he's like, I can do this. This is fun. He, like, this helps he me seems get things. really content. Like he yeah. just seems yeah. comfortable when you put him on yeah. his back. He's like obsessed with his feet now. So he'll just kind of play with his feet and look around and he doesn't care about being on his front. And then when he's on his front, he's just kind of pushing it. He doesn't love to be on his stomach as much. So it's not a great motivator for him. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot about Jess when you said you were offering his, I think, giraffe or some toy to him. He was like, "Eh." yeah, (laughs) you know, like, oh, too far. Yeah, it's exactly like that. And he just stares at me like, what do you want? What do you want from me, mom? I'm fine. (laughs) We were also I was telling Phil how you do naked tummy time. And he was like, what did he say? I can't remember. But we were both like, oh. I was like, I can't do that with Buddy. He would pee. I mean, now, of course, oh. he would. But back then, I feel like he would just be like, I'll roll over so I can pee in every room. And it would does. still pee everywhere. He yeah. does. Well, I mean, so... yes, as I get older, they're like. <laughs> <laughs> so I put I put down plastic. I, you know, like the Costco toilet paper, the plastic that comes on the outside. Oh, yeah. So I keep that. I keep those. And I lay those down. And then I put towels on top. And he does pee probably two or three times okay. while he's laying there. Um, Why do you do it naked? Well, we do cloth diapers and it's a little bit more restrictive for him. Oh, and I and sense. I have okay. heard too that diapers in general and clothing just can be more restrictive. And he loves being mm-hmm. naked. He just he moves more when he's on his changing table when he's naked. He he flexes his legs more and grabs his feet more. He makes more of an attempt. So um it definitely he does move a lot more when he when I do the naked tummy time. But word of caution, he has pooped now twice doing it so and that was not fun the 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 first time he did it it was like it was like a lot but thankfully he was on the towels and we were able to clean it up but that was he had never done that before we've been doing that we've been doing naked tummy time for like a month and he has never pooped on it before and that was not fun was it like going back to the windy was tj like see he can do it on his own (laughs) (laughs) like Completely different. Totally different time. Yeah, yeah. Totally different. <laughs> so my the thing that I wanted to... I wanted to mention two things. Just one thing real quick and then something I've been thinking about for a while. So my mom brain has been so bad. And it kind of hit me last night that I felt almost victimized. Like, um, we've talked about this before when you can, like, remember how smart you used to be. And now mm-hmm. you aren't that way and I don't know that I'd ever have thought like when I was in high school I wasn't like oh I'm super smart I never really felt distinctly 
like that. But I do remember being the person that my friends would turn to to ask how to spell something. And, and I attribute that to my mom always saying, look it up when I ask her. <laughs> and so as time went on, and I think part of it's because of uh, like autocorrect or spell check and things like mm. that with, you know, computers or technology. But I also think that things aren't even registering. Like I made a post, like the one I was just referencing with Buddy about repetition and I was like okay sounded out pretty repetition and I spelled it wrong and then my sister-in-law kindly pointed it out to me and she was kind about it but I looked at it later because I remember having fixed something and I was like so devastated because it didn't even register where I was <laughs> writing it I I don't even think it like told yeah. me it was wrong so if I don't have electronics telling me something <laughs> spelled wrong and it doesn't register I'm a lost cause I'm just gonna look like somebody that can't spell because I can't spell because <laughs> that is me and I just feel like it feels so sad, not the spelling as much as having had something and now I don't. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have much before. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and Phil's really good about like words and things like that. And I ask him how to spell stuff and he like, he's like this human spelling bee all on his own or whatever. And so, but I was like, you didn't have children. It like turns all personal fast, you know? <laughs> Okay, so my uh, this thought came to me the other day. Um, it was a few weeks ago, I guess. But when the pandemic, or rather when the um, like social distancing was put into place, and there was a lot more confusion or panic. I think there's a lot more panic than there is now because there's still probably as much confusion. Just we're a little bit more settled into life as it is, and we aren't as worried in the same ways, at least. Anyway, the thought kind of came to me. And I'll ask, or I'll more or less say in a question, do you guys ever get wrapped up in the worry of things, like whether it be in the current situation or, or if there's anything that's like causing a lot of confusion, getting wrapped up in the worry of those things, and then you struggle making a big decision, like struggle progressing in your own life because of the unknown of the entire sphere that you live in. I was gonna say world, but that's, that's too big. That's not always affecting us, you know. Can you guys relate to that? Um, I don't know if, well, okay. So I think the biggest th thought that came to mind was when to start trying to get pregnant again for us. Uh -huh. Because I think there's just like my family wants to plan a cruise and then there's just a lot of different things, factors, and my anxiety. We want to try to plan it so that that's good, but... Like, we want to plan to where my third trimester and when I deliver will both be in the summer. And this isn't related to the pandemic, but this is just, like, my... Isn't it called analysis paralysis? That's kind of what... Um, yeah, yeah. No, but this is exactly what you're talking about. Is exactly, exactly what I want to know about. Yeah. And so there's just so many different... Well, the like, pandemic affects yeah. that, too, because... Yeah. Cody, because, like, most hospitals... Unless you have a home birth, most hospitals mm -hmm. now are letting one or two, maybe two people yep. in, so... That will affect your decision sure. as There's well. There's just so many factors that are going into that big decision. I mean, everything else for us is like, well, if you know, if it if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Sure. But a pregnancy is a big deal, and it's not something where it's like, if I get pregnant and have horrible anxiety again, it's whatever. Like, that's there's a, a lot to it. Yeah, or we pay, you know, two thousand dollars to go on a cruise, and then don't get to because I didn't plan my pregnancy right. It's just so many, so many factors. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That are hard to consider. And, and when do we want to try? And what if I don't get pregnant right away? And then that messes up other things, you know, and then I end up having my third trimester and my whole first six months of postpartum in the winter. Right. You know, and, and, and that may make things 10 times worse. I don't know, but it's, it's a lot of thinking and, and, consideration mm -hmm. <laughs> that goes yeah. into that decision. thanks for your thoughts on that Jess did you can you relate to that um I well, I mean I don't necessarily let worry affect like I, I I don't sit and worry about but I do take a lot more action when something is giving me anxiety or when there is a lot to consider I will do a lot more thinking and research and planning and I, I definitely don't let it allow me to not make a decision, but I am, I am feeling that way specifically about the pandemic and, you know, the, the state's reopening and so many people are resuming life as normal. 
and when to wear a mask and where to wear a mask. And if I'm invited to a 4th of July party and I'm, am I going to go, you know, like those types of things, it's, there's so much up in the air with, you know, we already kind of talked about it in our COVID-19 episode, but there's, there's so much information that we're still waiting on. And it's still like every single day we're getting more and more information. And most of the information that we're getting is making things look better, which is promising, but yeah. you still, there's still so much that we don't know. And it's hard for me to just be carefree and be like, yeah, cool. I can go, let's go and do this. You know, it's so like, we're still as a family trying to discuss every, every day, how things look. And, uh, if things come up, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. And for me, for that specifically, I'm just kind of like judging on how important something is. I can't remember if I mentioned on the podcast, but we went to my grandpa's nursing home with some family members and stayed outside. It was his birthday. You didn't. That's sweet. Um, and so we made, they made posters for him and we sang him ha- happy birthday and talked to him on the phone. But we were all there just like through a glass uh, door, you know. And it was, you know, with other people and we were not doing social distancing and we weren't wearing masks. But I felt like that was a really important thing for us to do. And we did it. So every kind of every move we make right now has to be calculated in, in our opinion. And that can be overwhelming sometimes to just, yeah, yeah, just be like, I wish that it were easier. I wish that everything was okay. And it was a lot easier to just be like, yeah, okay, let's go back to normal. But it's not, it's like everything we have to think about everything. Yeah, like if you just make a decision and go, like before it might have had other variables, like what are we going to do with Jamie? But now it's like, right. Well, what is everyone else doing or whatever? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, yeah, if, if the pandemic weren't even a thing, we would probably still be doing this with, you know, do do we leave Jamie? Who who watches him? And, you know, like having a baby is hard enough yeah. trying to <laughs> trying to like go out on a date or whatever. So, yeah, it's it's pretty difficult time for us over here as far as decision making goes. I kind of was thinking along the lines of what you were saying, Cody, um, just by myself, not necessarily like a decision with it or with Phil and I. And I just started thinking about how there's so many unknowns. And I know that that's a really easy like mental rabbit hole to fall in if you're not yeah. careful to you know, worry about too many what ifs. And so I'm not necessarily talking about that because I logically get that that's not helpful, but it's really easy to say, like, be in the present. But we can't do that. Like you were just talking about in your example, Cody, right? Like you mm-hmm. have to consider other things, especially things that you know that might happen. And so yeah. it's like, if, and, and I was thinking, you know, I don't, I don't have anything like that, fortunately, that I know of, like your uh, situation with your anxiety. But I was thinking about how there's rules and things like that uh, right now. And I thought, well, people have talked about schools not even being let back into session next mm-hmm. year. Well, what if I want to have a baby next year? Then, like, will the hospitals continue? You know, like, things like that are really overwhelming it, just in concept, you know. And I think it's really yeah. easy to get, like well, I can't control it or do I just assume that I'm never going to be able to have this many people or you know what I'm saying? Just if it's easier, I'm more or less just talking like it's easy to spin out about that and then do nothing. But if I feel like I need to do something, then it it can just be really overwhelming, you know? Yeah. My personal opinion is always to do something, you know, like that, that to me is the worst just because of my personality the letting the unknown or letting the anxiety prevent you from doing something that is really important to you. And if it's the wrong thing that you're doing, at least you are pursuing something and you're making a choice and you're trying to fulfill your life in, you know, a positive way. And so like, especially when it comes to having more kids, which is like a really big and, you know, fulfilling eternal decision. I mean, it it is big, but like I would caution not, you know, not letting the situation disrupt that if you feel like that's a good way to go, because that is, it's much bigger than kind of what's going on in, in the world or whatever. Yeah. Like just starting something, like you said, doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Like I wouldn't be like, Oh, if, if they don't let anybody in there with me, you know, that's a really scary thought, but you know, people are doing it and I'm sure any one of us would be able to do it and, and come out the other side and, you know, have, have a baby out of it, which is, you know, a miracle and 
full of joy. So yeah, yeah you just kind of have to, for us, we just kind of have to weigh those options and figure out what's worth it and hopefully take action on things. Well, thanks so much guys for all your thoughts. That was a great catch up. Um, we'll go ahead and go to our product praise. Cody, do you have something for us? Yeah, I do right here. <laughs> um, so we, uh, on Kizzy and color. Oh shoot. I don't remember her name. They I had don't know a, her name either. Jennifer. I, I can oh, yeah. find it. Yeah. What's her Jennifer. account name? Oh, it's Kizzy and color. Oh, you mean the other no, lady? No, 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 the other lady. Oh, I don't know. She had a guest come on who's a speech pathologist and she talked about different um, sippy cups or water bottles or just kid cups and the benefits and downsides of each or disadvantages and advantages. And she said one thing that you should look out for is the type of straw that your kids are using. So she discouraged using short, hard sippy cup straws, kind of like the conventional ones that come in the pack. She said those... They, ha- they make the children's, anything that makes the child's tongue come out like when they're breastfeeding or when they're drinking a bottle. So like uh, the tongue coming out, that is not going to benefit their speech as much in the long term. And so she said to find something that has a soft and, and longer straw, kind of like the straws that we drink from. Mm-hmm. Or so this- Like this? I just have one of these. I wonder if this is... Yes, kind of like, yes, mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Which and just, so we, I just want to interject real quick. My kids have started sucking out of these, and you know, I don't know what I at, at what age they start uh, taking over everything you eat and drink, but I think we're there. And yeah. that's that's I don't know how long that is, about three inches on the top. Yeah, she didn't give a specific length, but just just if it mimics a regular straw that adults drink from, it's it's going to be a better option because the tongue when we do that, it makes like more of a like a c shape and then it moves to the top of our palate and so that like curling yes you curling mean. yes and i don't know why i'm not a speech pat- uh, pathologist but she just said it was better so we <laughs> found this cup it's it's a like a little thermos right is what it's called insulated thermos brand thermos i mean that's what brand. it said on there i think oh it says food or f- oh f- fugo Fogo. i thought i saw thermos on there sorry on the bottom maybe but it I'm does like, say thermos. Def- yeah, I like defend right. myself. <laughs> you're right. It does say thermos on the bottom. I just didn't see it. Um, and we like it. I always like the water bottles that have a nice like lock option that is a little more difficult for kids to open because otherwise my son is doing this the entire time and all of the water is spilling yes. on my floor. And it, it's pretty leak proof. The water stays cold for a good amount of time because it is lined with the metal. And I think it's BPA free and... All the other things. The, is this the good stainless stuff. steel? Yes. The metal? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the thing I really like is the straw because it is a long, it kind of mimics the straws we drink out of and it's removable. So I can show you this. Whoa, that part comes off too. I'm learning something new every day. Well, that doesn't make it easier. Okay. So these come apart. I just learned this. It comes apart in two parts and you can take it out so it's easy to clean. So much easier, I bet. Cool. Thank you. We'll go ahead and uh, transition there to our topic, which is kids and pets. And we all have pets and we all love pets. And uh, I know that Jess has a cat, and but we all have dogs. And so I'm interested to hear your opinion, Jess, as we're talking about some of these, if you think they apply to cats as well. Because um, I found three articles. I don't know if either of you had any articles that you wanted to include. Okay, that's okay. I found one. Oh, you did? Okay. So with the with the information that we all have um I mean sorry I can't speak for yours the information that I found <laughs> it talks about things that I'm like eh, I feel like a lot of this is directed to dogs so for you yes, listeners same with mine. yeah did you yeah I'd love to know um from you listeners if you have any pets and if you think some of these things apply and I will also say now that at least of the things the tips that I found I don't think they're necessary for I'll speak for just dogs for a minute for every dog I think you need to understand your dog and the length of time you've had your dog and some variables so everything that we share will be of course information that we found or that we've experienced and then you can decide how you want to apply those so um I have a couple I think three different categories and maybe you can tell me Cody where yours fits in or if it's a or if it's a fourth one but I had thought of introducing newborns to pets uh kids and pets generally just new relationships or interactions but I found an article that talks about zero through eight years old and then oh actually I forgot about one category there we go of petting the dog and um, benefits of having pets 
did your article fit in any of those or is the fifth one was was benefits of having pets its own yeah it's the last yeah, one prob- mm-hmm. probably the benefits of having pets is okay. mine, what mine fits into okay so if it's okay let's talk about the first ones and i'll reference of course, we'll post the refer- or the referenced websites in our show notes, but I'll just briefly mention them as, as I go through as well. The first section on like introducing a newborn or bringing a newborn home, if you, you know, birth out of the home, then um, that is from akc.org. Changing routine before the baby arrives. I thought this one was interesting. I don't know what you guys think about this, but what they said is it's so that the baby or the dog doesn't associate change with the baby. Um, And I like Mm. that idea, you know, not negative association, but it was like, well, something that I could relate to is like bringing the gear in the home. So they're used to having that around. But then it mentioned going on walks with the stroller and things like that. Conceptually, I, I get it. So the dog understands routine. But I'm just waiting for somebody to be like, like, it's empty. I don't know. Do you put the dog? I feel like it could be weird yeah. depending on where you live. And and maybe it depends on your dog, too. Because mm-hmm. I don't think my dog, Sevi, is so oblivious to things like that. Like, whether or not I was had a stroller means nothing to her. If, yeah. If the ball is anywhere in sight, that's all she cares about. <laughs> and if not, then she's just, like, having a good time. So yeah. I understand things like having baby stuff around. Maybe if there's going to be a drastic change in, like, the amount of exercise they're going to be getting for a while, yeah. mm-hmm. adjusting to that beforehand, because that was something that Sevi had a hard time with in my third trimester, because my first two trimesters, I was going out every single day almost with her and running her a lot, and then I couldn't do that in the third trimester, and so she would cry a lot, but I just couldn't, I couldn't right. do it every day, and so... Thankfully, when Emmett got here, she was kind of more used to not spending as much time outside, and it wasn't a huge adjustment. That's, that's perfect that you said that. That's actually the second one that they mentioned, adjusting the attention that you give. And they said oh. two weeks before, but that was great that you gave that whole um, trimester of adjustment, as sad as it is. And it's really – we weren't very good about that, that I know of. Maybe it happened more organically than I realized. I mean, we were working as it is. And I don't remember. She might have gone over to your house, my dog Leah, during some of the time. So she probably still got some. Um, so I think there was an adjustment period. But with your dogs and your cat, Jess, um, you can say their names if you want to. I don't know if you have. But <laughs> for confidentiality's sake. Um, I can't remember if you did anything specific with that, whether it be attention or gear. Well, so our, our situation was about was the opposite because um, TJ and I both worked full time. So our dogs would, we, we would come home for lunch. One of us would come home for lunch every day and take them out and feed them, you know, lunch or a bone or whatever, and then go back to work. But for the majority of the day, one of our dogs stayed in a crate because she was more comfortable there and um, she was more destructive. And then Crouton, our golden retriever, was used to being on the main floor of the house. So she would be there, but she wouldn't really do anything. She'd just kind of lay on the couch. We have a camera up so we could see her and um, talk to her. So me, towards the end of my pregnancy, quit my job and came home. And so now I'm home full time. So they're actually getting more attention, maybe less exercise because we were exercising them a lot to make up for us being at work. They were getting two to three walks a day or going outside two to three times a day. And now they don't, now it's more like once a day, but they still, there's somebody around all the time. There's people here all the time. So they are actually getting more attention now. And as far as like the walks go, we never did anything like that. Like I never walked an empty stroller, but we did put up our gear. Um, I did uh, assemble the stroller and leave it up for a couple of weeks. We had a baby swing assembled and up and they were a little bit curious about it, but then they just kind of got over it. And I think the biggest help for that was actually with their toys because we were able to you know, baby toys and dog toys are very similar. Sometimes they're soft and they make noise, like especially squeaks. Um, Jamie has a couple of toys that squeak and we, we purposely do not squeak them because the dogs love that the most. But we were able to kind of like every time they would get curious about the toy or they try to play with it or whatever, we would tell them no. And now there's toys all over the floor and they don't even try. So that was really helpful to get that started early. So they didn't just tear up all of his toys yeah that was one of the things they had talked or mentioned about um when your dog has a toy not to 
I mean, you said no, and I don't know what extent you went, but it says don't scold the dog for picking up baby's toys. We weren't great about that because I didn't even know about that. We would just, I don't know. We weren't trying to be scary, but that wasn't really, we just defaulted to be like, no, bad or whatever. Um, I think it's hard when you're stressed, like after the babies come home or mm. whatever. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier, like, I don't know, sometimes your responses are different when you're stressed, right? Or tired. <laughs> anyway, especially if your dog's a chewer, I'm sure it could be like, ah, you're going to ruin the whatever. And Leah kind of goes nuts about stuff uh, we, we have this one oh, good. oh I was just gonna say we train them previously so mm-hmm. anytime they're getting going to get something we don't want them to we say leave it and then we give them a treat when so they good. don't touch it so now if with the baby toys we just say leave it and then they leave it but it now we don't even have to say that like we we were able to do that enough times that now they're like okay that smells like the baby that means it's not mine so they don't go after it that's so great I don't know if it's because Sebi's just super smart, but uh, yeah, she, I don't think she's ever at our house shoot up. There was one time at someone else's house that she thought kid toy was a dog toy, and I think it's because the kids were trying to play with her mm, like yeah. a dog toy, but she's never done it at our house, and I don't know if this is why, but I do know that we have a separate place for Sebi's toys. We have a bin that's her toy bin, and so she knows where she goes to get toys and doesn't mess with toys that aren't in that bin. So maybe that's a tip if people are struggling with. Yeah, I think that's really good, too. And they even talk about having like a place of their own. Like Mm -hmm. you do, Sevi has her place that you'll defend and make sure, you know, and that's something that they talk about, like with, I can't remember which which website it talked about, but that was a tip, making sure they have a safe place that they can destimulate. And especially, so I can can expand on that a little bit. Please. So Sevi, there are very few things I allow her to be defensive with. I do not allow her to be defensive with food. She does not get to, like, there's no growling, no guarding with that, not toys. Um, But her bed... I allow her to, if if kids come near her bed and she growls, I do not scold her for that because that is her place. Mm -hmm. And if Sevi needs to get away, they should know they don't mess with her in there. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good training tip, but I do know that she deserves a place where she she doesn't have to worry about getting her hair, her, her ears pulled and getting picked up by little kids or whatever it is she should have a spot that she's like okay I'm safe here I can chill even when it's chaos yeah I'm curious Cody is Sevy's is Sevy's bed just an open dog bed or is it a crate it is not either (laughs) so we have like (laughs) we have um kind of built they're like faux built-in things on the side of our fireplace Mm. and there's a slot at the very bottom that I just slid her dog bed into and that's what it is so it's not something where the door closes but it's like kind of enclosed it but it is enclosed I'm curious because Evie our our standard poodle she's the one that needs to be in the crate and she is becoming more comfortable with us but she'll lay down she'll relax and then if anyone moves makes a movement or whatever she gets up and sometimes if she's real tired she snaps or she growls or whatever because she's Mm. she I don't think she feels safe so she spends the time in her crate and she'll just lay down and she'll be great and super comfortable and whatever because she has that kind of physical barrier so I was wondering if it's a, a poodle thing or because Crouton's not like that at all. She's just, she'll lay all over you and you can do whatever to her and it doesn't matter. Maybe it was a poodle thing, but I just, yeah, kids always try to, And I say, don't, don't go over there. Do not mess with, even if they're going to pet her soft, Yeah. no one messes with Sebby when she's in her bed and, mm. and that's what works for our family. So. Yeah. I think that's really good as well. I mean, me personally, as well as it's consistent with things that I've been reading, just you mentioned the dogs recognizing a toy smells like Jamie um they talk about acclimating and this is something that we try to do as well letting helping them acclimate to baby smell like when we were in the hospital we'd wrap up our kids in the blanket and then send it home with Phil because he didn't stay the night at the hospital and so they I don't know if it really did anything but I don't think it hurt (laughs) yeah yeah this is something I'm interested to know what you guys uh, did as well. So arriving home with the newborn, their recommendations on the AKC website were to first greet your dog alone and then allow your dog to adjust to the smell, sight, and sound of the baby. After a few days, allow the dog to sniff the baby while on a leash. And then once used to the smell, allow the dog to smith- sniff the baby off leash. We did like a quarter of those things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so- <laughs> I, I think I greeted Sebby by myself and then... 
let her sniff Emmett right after that, and then we were it was whatever. That's yeah. what. But again, I have a very small, very mild, friendly poodle. Mm-hmm. Like, right. it will be so different if I had a very high energy rescue dog that I would approach very different than my situation. I totally see where they're coming from. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I had all these grand expectations. Like you, you see all the videos, especially with golden retrievers, right? When you bring the baby home and the dog does all these really cute, funny stuff or whatever. We had these just total expectations and we got home and they literally could not care less. We were gone (laughs) for two days. So they were super excited to see TJ and to see me. And we had to like point, we had to direct them to the car seat. Like, Hey, look, there's a there's a thing in there, you know? <laughs> and then once Kurtan kind of noticed, she she smelled and she tried to get up to kind of, you know, get in his face and stuff. So we had to hold her back a little bit. But Evie didn't even try. Evie just <laughs> did not care one bit and still really doesn't to this to this day. I think Cur- I think that's kind of poodles. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Poodles are just kind of like, eh. Whatever. Yeah, like, I know the I, rules. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's kind of a poodle. Every poodle I've met is not about like, oh, you're a kid. Like, let's be friends. They're like, yeah, nah. yeah. She Send just she want. likes to mess with the cat, but she really does not care about the baby <laughs> at all. Sebby <Debbie> <laughs> loves cats. Your cat oh. Gus is more of a threat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he lays in her bed now. Like he goes oh. into her crate and he and she doesn't seem to mind that. I think they're friends. Everyone in the family thinks they hate each other because they always like nip and hiss and chase each other and whatever but i think they're secretly best friends and that's just how they show their love (laughs) that's great tom and tom and jerry right yeah i'm just gonna say that (laughs) that's funny we just came home um i mean phil would come home at night and so leah didn't have that like time to miss him or whatever i mean we're gone to the mailbox and she's like (gasps) but after (laughs) you know like when i came home i think she was like oh yeah 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 and that to me and I don't think I agreed to her alone. I don't remember now. It's been 18 months, but I think that I think that we did probably pull her aside and we held her and then let her sniff around the car seats and kept them just like on the floor and so we could Oh, that's right. I think cuz I then I could pick up the car seat if I was worried that she would jump cuz she's tons more wiry than, you know, <laughs> Sevy at least. I I don't know how I I can't really compare crouton and evie and wiriness to leah but just different but i definitely think that she's definitely more wiry than any of our pets (laughs) than all of our pets combined yeah but you know i felt comfortable enough to do that way because just by nature she wasn't aggressive um Mm. she's just excited and so i did worry about her jumping in the car seat and trying to figure it out because we did have the car seats there before so she did recognize you know in the home so I did tell Phil that if we have another child, I would like to try some of those things. She acts a little more aggressive than she should when she's on a leash. And so I think it maybe was a better Mm -hmm. move. So again, kind of what I said at the beginning, if you feel like your dog has a different, I mean, I think it's different. There's a difference between understanding the temperament of your dog and assume your dog won't do something. I think there's still, you know, air on the side of caution, but you don't necessarily have to feel bad if you didn't do this because we all didn't do all of these things either. (laughs) And then... A couple more things on the go- coming home with the newborn. They mentioned making sure to give plenty of attention to your dog when the baby's around. And I love this because when I read it, I thought, that's so true. At least with Leah, I will so often get wrapped up in the busyness of life. And I'll look over even still and see her, what I think is sad and alone on the side of the couch. And she will play almost any time. But I feel like she's more... I, I don't know if depressed, but, you know, kind of disheartened than she used to be. I don't know if she'll ever, like, get to Forlorn. To that's what we say. That's, Crouton that's always looks at us like she's so forlorn that we won't play with her or whatever. Yes. So I think if there's, and I've been told that, like, spend time with your dog. Make sure you go on walks, just you two. But that's, like, better, easier said than done, really. <laughs> Who has time to go on any walks, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, now it's different. <laughs> yeah. It's like, me. <laughs> who's not going on walks that's what yeah, that's right, the question right, right now it's, but you it's know more bike at the very rides, beginning it's bike rides. yeah 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 but you know at the very beginning when you're just learning especially as first-time parents yeah um you know and a lot of we've talked about this too that if that some of our friends have said things like i was so bored all i did was watch tv all day and i was like what <laughs> i mean that's just the difference of having a singleton to, to twins or whatever there's always harder and easier on both sides but yeah. i just feel like 
I, I was also the winter. So maybe that's part of it that I didn't, mm. I, you know, so. So one thing that Eden did that I thought was cute, and I don't, I don't know if he's doing this to like for himself or for Sevi or what, but he would like, he would come home from work and he would give Sevi loves and be like, Sevi, I didn't forget about you. I still love you, Sevi. I didn't forget about you often. And I thought it was the sweetest thing. I don't know if she understands or any of that, but it was just, it was sweet. That's so sweet. I love that. So I think this is a good time to transition um, to another section. But the the last one was never leave even the most trusted dog alone with a baby or a small child. And I have a hard time with that one because I don't worry about Leah being alone with my kids. I don't worry about Sevi being alone with the kids. But I think it's their recommendation is like erring on the side of extreme safety. You know, if you it is always safer. And I think I think it's like. Well, one, I wouldn't go to the store and be like, Leah, you got this girlfriend, you know, but... <laughs> yeah, don't leave them as babysitters. Yeah, sure. but I I definitely don't worry about, like, if I go to the bathroom and Buddy often shuts the door on me, which is nice mm-hmm. now, instead of, like, the fingers under the door <laughs> gives me some privacy. But, you know, I'm not worried that Leah's going to attack them in the slightest. So, But they're, I mean, they're kind of just now coming into the age where they might do something to hurt her. Yeah. So in the next couple of years, because they they don't have any kind of they don't recognize, obviously, that what they're doing is painful or they may not recognize any warning signs from the dog. Crouton is so tolerant of everything and anything until she isn't. And then she'll kind of snap. And we've tried to train her to give more warnings and stuff. But I, I don't believe she would hurt Jamie at all. Because she's very tolerant with human beings. But with other animals, you know, you never know when with her when that line is going to be. So I think with a lot of dogs, it is it is good advice to make sure. Just, again, know, know your dog and what they're capable of. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think with my child, we've been working for his whole mobile life. So from the time he's been crawling till now on boundaries with Sevy. So touching Sevy soft, not playing in her bed, like not going to her bed and bothering her. And he understands, I would say, very well what what he's allowed and not allowed to do with Sevi at this point. He doesn't try anything. Now, maybe he will when he's older, but there are children I would not leave my dog alone with. Hmm. Not because I think she's going to hurt them, but I think because they're going to hurt her, maybe because they haven't had a lot of exposure to animals that Mm -hmm. don't understand what hurts them, what's okay and what's not okay, things like that. So... There are circumstances, and maybe if you have a kid that's a little bit more aggressive and not as naturally, and and Emmett's not, I'm not like, he's the most, he's an angel, (laughs) but he also isn't, I don't think, inclined to like go over and hit dogs. And that, it just boils down to, you have to work on boundaries with your kids and and other kids as well. And so if if you feel like your kids are, are, understand the boundaries with your dog, there's probably like trial periods like, okay, I'm going to go to the bathroom and come back. Okay, I'm going to let you do independent play for 15 minutes and the dog will be there and then see how that goes. I think that's kind of how we did it. It was little by little. But at this point, I don't worry about it at all. Sevi can spend as much or a little time around Emma and I don't see it as a problem. The only thing that we that I care about now, like if Jamie's on the floor playing or whatever, Literally, Evie cares so little about him that she will often step on him. Uh, Or if she gets, like, excited or something and she wants to kind of run over to do, you know. So she has done that to him a couple of times, which has not hurt him, really. It's just startled him. But, yeah, that's the only thing that I can't really leave them alone when he's not mobile because they'll she'll just run over him. Yeah. That's how Leah was when they were tiny and then... Now she has this thing where she she's not aggressive to them, but she's very annoyed. Mm. Like their feet away from her, and I hear this little this little rumble of a growl, and then it just gets louder <laughs> as they get closer. And I'm she don't and I, do it. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> say things like calm down. They can be in the same room. I swear it's like they're breathing my air, mom. Like, she's <laughs> it's so all this all this sibling syndrome. Yeah, she's like. Everything was fine until they came along kind of attitude. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, my gosh. But then there's other times where they'll do something. I can't think of it, an example, but something that I would think that she would freak out about. 
and like she has her ball for example and they they've been getting more figuring out muscle things and a little bit rougher and things that I have had to say no she will bite you like today Swiss was pulling up on her mouth like on her (laughs) snout for her teeth to show and she just sat there and let it happen and I'm like (laughs) that yeah they can't have their feet near you but they can pull up your chops to see yeah exactly they can't be like three feet away on the bed and she's like don't you come near me Mm -hmm. Phil's had to have talks with her he says being near you is not the same as stepping on you. I'm not sure it's sinking in yet because we've had this talk about 15 times. But yeah, super weird. But mm-hmm. So some of the things that they said on the, um, the, sorry, the website for this is raisingchildren.net.au. I think it's an Australian website, which is only the reason I mention is a few listeners go, they have some terms. I mean, you'll see in the in the web address, but it says things like, this and this while you're changing your child's nappy. <laughs> they cover some things that we've already covered. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead on those, but you'll see those if you go to the website. But I like that it talks about asking friends and relatives to supervise or separate your child and their dogs. And I think it goes back to what we we're saying, like understanding the relationship. And I think it's the same relation, or I mean, sorry, conversation that you'd have if your friend has a pool, you know, something yeah. like that. Or maybe your baby and older kids. Like, I feel like it's about communication, you know, with that and understanding. Yep. And then this I liked. It was it was talking about meeting a new dog or if you're, you know, unfamiliar. It was saying to ask, of course. That's pretty classically known. But then not petting on the head um, so that, I don't know if it's all dogs because obviously my dogs chill with, like, her face being molested <laughs> but but not by everybody that she's very different with buddy and swiss obviously i don't even know that she would be cool with with um emmett doing that i don't know um and so you know i think if it's a dog you're not familiar with definitely even if you've gotten permission um be not on their head and then it said to look down at the ground so you're not confrontational and to keep your hands down by your sides and this was an interesting one i had never heard of to approach it at a curve instead of straight on to not, you know, create like a power struggle, I think, or dominance. So yeah. I thought those were interesting points. And then it said if your child's ever like knocked over by the dog or the dog starts to chase, don't try to outrun the dog, um, which that's a little bit scary. And I'm not going to I'm not going to pretend I understand the best way to approach that, because if a big dog's running after me, I'm not sure what yeah, I would I do. Chill, but like, yeah, exactly. But I it was saying, I- <laughs> yeah, it was saying that if you do get knocked over, to just like to roll up and that kind of reminds me of like a bear they like cover your neck and stuff like that so I don't know read up more on that your <laughs> yourselves listeners but <laughs> if I had my kid I'd probably try to create like a shelter like a shield like them in the middle and me on the oh outside. yeah for sure I think if it's like an older child like say the child's on their own they're six or five or something like that yeah. I know my sister you taught was always telling she taught her son or I'm sorry I'd, I've heard her say this several times to her son to like put your knee up kind of hmm. so that they're not getting the face yeah well yes I think to like hit the dog in the face but also so that his hmm. genitals are protected oh like if the dog because he's about I don't know how tall he is but you know he's he's about nine years old and so anyway yeah I think that that Makes was cool. it wasn't something I read but yeah just giving him something to bite that's not gonna cause a bunch of surgery yeah yeah basically that's my mm-hmm. takeaway from that and i i have so i think those are great points for like dogs that you don't know and you you know or especially if you don't know the owners but we have had some because we have the large dogs right you guys yeah. both have the small dogs and so i'm sure people treat you differently and mm-hmm. kids treat you differently than yeah. they do us that our dogs so many people act as though our dogs are just going to viciously attack them at any moment. And I'm talking a standard poodle and a golden retriever, like the two most lovable, stereotypically lovable dogs. And we still get that. And kids, and I don't know, it's mostly kids that don't have experience with large dogs, but they're Mm -hmm. always terrified, always terrified and don't know what to do when they get knocked over like on accident or whatever. And Crouton loves kids so, so much. And so she'll jump 
on them to try to kiss their face and stuff. And they just feel like they're being eaten alive. I mean, it's just, so as a dog owner, I mean, obviously we try to train her not to jump, but she just gets so excited with little kids. It's really hard to do, but we're doing our best to train them. But I don't know. I I would advise anyone if you know the dog is not unfriendly, like if you, if you're fairly certain that you know that they're, you know, nice or whatever, and your kid is afraid of them, do your best to teach your kid that they're okay or that they shouldn't be afraid. Like, and, and as a dog owner of large dogs, if there's anything that I can do to make it so that your child can be more comfortable, because I feel like that's a really important thing for kids to be comfortable around animals and to treat them with kindness and respect and, and everything like that. And I don't know. I just feel like the dynamic is so much different when you have large dogs versus small dogs. Everyone just automatically thinks small dogs are just harmless. It's like polar opposites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. Which is clearly not, I'm mean, not clearly, yeah. sorry. To me, it's clear that that's not true. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. You can have aggressive small dogs. That's, that's real. Yeah. Cause every dog can feel threatened. It's actually more common because small dogs have more, um, like territory issues that because they are small so they have to kind of make up for that so they are yeah. more likely to be aggressive territorial and large dogs are just like whatever I'm huge I'm gonna lay here and you know not care so I don't know I I don't have any I tried to look up some some resources or something that talks about that dynamic um, or how to help your kid be more comfortable around large dogs and I could not find anything at all but From what I have seen from friends of ours that have the most success that they have with their kids is to just, when they get knocked down, treat them like they're fine. Like any other time that they would fall over or whatever, just be like, you're okay, get back up, you know, and to just try to familiarize them with the dogs that you trust, that are friendly, that you know aren't going to hurt them and give them more exposure. Like just because your kid is afraid doesn't mean that you want to limit that exposure. You want to give them safe places to be exposed so that they can be more comfortable and know how to handle themselves in the future. Just my opinion. No, I like that. I like that. I have, I have a couple of thoughts on it. I think that's, I agree with that. And then my other thought is that they also need to know boundaries though, for like, like dogs, they don't know. They need to understand like the difference, you know, because I I have a, a friend, a girl I know who said, her child just loves like all dogs. He has no no healthy respect for that. And she's like, I'm just waiting for him to stick his hand through and lose after I'm like, don't do that. Don't yeah. do that. And he's like, you don't know anything. All dogs are nice. All dogs are my friends, you know, or whatever. And that's, it's really hard because I don't want people to be afraid of dogs, but I also have, you know, we do have a small dog. She's like less than six pounds. And people have said, can I pet your dog? And I think she's nice. But I also know she does have territorial issues. And sometimes she does say, like, we might say, okay, well, just make sure to pet her, like, on her back. Or pretty much that's the safest place. I believe that's what we've told them. And they go, okay. And she still snot. And she'll growl. (laughs) Maybe she'll, like, give a warning nip, which, fair enough. If she needs to give a warning nip, that's her communicating. I don't want her to feel, like, terrorized. Like, you have to be touched by people. I don't even want to be touched by everybody. So, (laughs) you know, like... I respect that, but I also feel like it reflects poorly, like we're liars or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so I think that it's good that they understand that it isn't a, you know, big dogs are bad and little dogs are safe, mm-hmm. but also that they can trust, like learn how to, like you, what you explained already. You know? Well, and we've tried to teach, at least with my sister, we've tried to teach her and, and maybe we humanize I think we humanize our animals more than the average person, um, especially. I don't know, T- not, especially not TJ. Us. <laughs> our our dog Eden like legitimately claims our dog is our firstborn child. So. Yes, us I as think you well. have a closet for her, right? <laughs> and we treat. Yes. <laughs> she has a wardrobe, and we brush her teeth every night, and <laughs> which is awesome. I need to do that. But we we've tried to you know with Katie growing up and everything we've we've tried to try to you know explain or teach or whatever our way of thinking which is that they are living creatures and they have moods and they have preferences and they have needs and you can't just she has this philosophy that just like oh I want to cuddle you come here and cuddle me right now and you know then thinks that they're stupid when they don't come and it's like well they don't want to because they're they are alive, you know, it's not a stuffed animal. And you have to treat, I think, all animals, 
in that way, that they are going to be temperamental depending on the situation. The nicest dog in the world will eventually bite someone who continues to kick them or hurt them or threaten them in some way to where they feel they need to for their safety or whatever it is. So I think that is the most important lesson that we can teach our kids to be cautious but understanding that they are all living creatures. And I think that can carry over to human beings as well when they want a friend to do something or they you know want someone to give them a toy that they're playing with they're human beings and we say that about our dogs too <laughs> we, we always had to correct ourselves but initially we always say because they're human well they're not human but they're living creatures right yeah they're, they're intelligent mm-hmm. they, they have feelings and they're yeah. smart yeah. yeah and they have memories and they deserve to be treated with respect, even mm-hmm. though they're dogs. We have a problem. I think there's a huge problem with kids not understanding how to meet a new animal. Mm-hmm. Every time I go to the park, every single time, I don't think there's been ever single one time where there has not been a child run up and start petting my dog without talking to me. And a lot of the time, as I go to the park, kids try to pick up my dog oh yes that is a big no-no I will let if they come up and pet my dog I will let that slide because I know my dog loves kids and and she enjoys the attention and it's a good interaction but I will not allow kids to hold my dog because they do not hold her right yeah how do you shut it down if if they reach down to pick her up I will pick up Sevy and I will say kids don't hold my dog I'm sorry kids are not allowed to hold my dog and we had this happen. Oh my goodness! This was a this was an interesting response too. We had this happen. We were at the park yesterday, and this one little girl kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And I would let her pet. She would start out petting, and then she'd go to pick her up because she wanted mm-hmm. to take her with her to whatever thing she was doing. And I kept telling her, "You cannot pick up my dog. You cannot pick up my dog." And finally, I said, "You you need to go play somewhere else because you keep trying to pick up my dog, and I do not let I do not let kids pick up my dog." And she lost it she was like bawling and screaming and her mom came back over with her and she said um can my child play with your dog and I said absolutely she is just not allowed to hold her up she can or pick her up she can pet her but she's not allowed to pick her up and this mom was like like taken back like how could you you said no yeah (laughs) and then she grabs her daughter's hand and walks away (laughs) good you're like that's what I wanted before (laughs) fine by me but you're not gonna carry around my dog she's not a stuffed animal so that's the advantage of having large dogs as well is people don't (laughs) think that kids don't think that they're stuffed animals Yeah. (laughs) yeah so it's definitely different challenges but I think in any case you should teach your kids the first thing you do is find the owner of the dog. If you want to interact with a dog, find the owner of a dog and ask if that dog is nice and if you can pet the dog. And then you make sure that, that the owner is there and then you know to pet the dog on the back softly and you don't pick up other people's dogs. Like, yeah, those should be things that everyone teaches because otherwise there are dogs that you, you don't know their history. You don't know if they're good with kids. And you should err on the side of caution because it's if, if a kid comes running up to my dog, I, I don't feel like it's my responsibility to pick up my dog every second that there's a kid running to no them. Kidding. You know, they should know, yeah. okay, I talk, to the, I talk to the owner before I touch the dog. And That's you're at opinion. the park, like, there's no laws against you being at the park with your dog, right? Mm-hmm. And so not. just like you're being at the park with your child, if somebody was, I, I I don't know, just if somebody was doing something that was bothering bothersome to Emmett, that's not your, like, now you have to avoid no, them. Like, right. Yeah, exactly, or whatever. And yeah. so same thing, like, your dog shouldn't, if your dog's basically being molested because, <laughs> you know, yeah. she has no, like, uh, she's helpless in that situation. She's tiny, I mean, unless she's mean. Or whatever, and, she's and then not. yeah, she just she just takes it, but she's not having fun, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, it, unless she's mean, she just has to have it, let it happen mm-hmm. to her. And then if she was mean, then suddenly you're this like terrible dog owner or whatever know. that you know, like exactly. Yeah. That's how I feel when when Leah gets all snippy. I'm like, uh, well, but kudos to her for being like, no, 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 no. Yeah, like, I don't like I don't what's know. happening. Yeah. yeah. So I feel for you. 
Um, okay, so on to the benefits of having dogs, though, because I can't remember what we said a minute ago, but it was a really good segue. <laughs> but I was wondering what you found, Cody, that kind of highlighted or tied into that. Okay, so I did a lot of research before having kids about the health benefits of having dogs, because I remember talking in a class about how it's really good for kids to grow up with pets and kids like kids that grow up on farms, especially specifically have lower rates of asthma and allergies in general and lower rates of sickness even they found with colds. And so I found I, I found this article that been around for a little bit. It was written in on April 7th, 2017. But I, I think the information still holds true. And it just talks about how kind of the things I was saying that the a child's microbiome, which is the bacteria that's inside of their body and on their skin, is more diverse in a good way than kids that are not exposed to pets. So they talked about a few different bacteria that kids um, are exposed to. They were talking about dogs specifically, but lower rates of obesity, asthma, allergies. And I think those are the ones they mentioned, but I, I saw another article that talked about illness in general. And I just think that's so good. It's so good for us to give our kids a chance, through the best chance in life. You know what I mean? And I found another article that talked about kids having higher self-esteem and more empathy with pets because they're able to get responsibility with pets and take on a nurturing role, which in turn gives them positive feedback about themselves and also having empathy, understanding that dogs feel, dogs feel things, animals feel things. And again, with that nurturing role, taking care of something else will have a positive impact on your self-esteem and your mental health. And so those were the main things that I found in my research, which... Thank you. Are all good. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. Something, uh, the article that I found was from pedigree.com. And it was talking about benefits, like health benefits with, well, lots, but they specifically also mentioned among pregnant women. They said there was a study that assessed over 11,000 pregnant women in the UK. And just noting on um, or touching on activity that is usually required if you're going to like really take care of your dog. And I know some, like depending on the size of your yard or the style of your yard, you can let your dog outside to run around. Or if you have a big enough home, like Leah can run around a lot, but she does get a a lot more energy out quickly when she can run outside. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's different like senses and things, but anyway, it was just saying how much of a benefit it can be to your health while pregnant, you know, by when you're going on walks and things like that. Um, Yeah. And then this I thought was kind of interesting. Oh, it said pet ownership may have a, have a beneficial effect on family harmony. Research shows that families spend a lot more time interacting after the acquisition of a pet. Pets provide a focus of fun for fun activities and friendly conversation. I think that's arguable because I don't know that there's plenty of pets in un healthy situations or dysfunctional families. Like, I don't believe that that's necessarily yeah. correlated. I think that's a great thing for pedigree to say. But, <laughs> <laughs> and I do think that there's a lot of love that comes from pets. Um, and I think that we would all agree about, you know, feeling that way. But I'm wondering, Jess, did you find that in your home? I mean, you had Gus first and then Crouton and then Evie. And I'm wondering if you saw maybe even just from Gus, adding Gus to your family or then with Crouton, did you see any more like unifying because I know like your brother-in-law he tends to when I've been over he tends to enjoy petting them did does he spend more time with you guys because of that I don't I mean I don't know if with just the pets if it was more or with just Gus probably not um because Gus goes downstairs you know he's all over the house so everyone kind of gets their own interaction with him but definitely when getting crouton I think we did more things together as a family. We definitely took more walks together and, you know, went to dog parks and things. And then of course, Evie was just kind of, we just happened upon her and we wanted her, we wanted to have a second dog. So crew would have a friend because we were, you know, like I said, working full time and stuff. And so I think the dogs did help us come together, but definitely having Jamie now when Jamie's downstairs, like if I'm making dinner or whatever, pretty much everyone in the house just kind of congregates in because they're like oh I hear him he's awake I'm gonna go you know whatever so I think he he has helped the family come together more than just the pets did but it was a little bit more moving from you know everyone kind of doing their own thing because we're like basically four adults in the house and so yeah having having that something to kind of 
get together to, you know, care for that animal or spend time together or whatever did help a little bit there. That's neat. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad we got to talk about that. We all love our animals so much and are so grateful to have them. And so if you as listeners have good experiences with your pets that you'd like to share with us, feel free to contact us on social media or send us an email or contact us through our website. Jessica, do you want to go ahead and share about your recipe? Yeah. So one of the, one of our favorite things to have in our house is tacos, multiple different kinds. And I'm not going to share a taco recipe, but I do have a side dish that we have a lot with um, tacos. And it's the recipe is called restaurant style Mexican rice. I'm not sure what makes it restaurant style, but (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I guess maybe Mexican restaurant, you know, they have rice, but anyway, it's so good. And we make it all the time, you know, to go with our tacos or with any kind of Mexican food that you're having. And it's so easy. It's just like, I do it in the rice cooker and you just put like the rice in and uh, you can do like garlic and tomato sauce and stuff. So it kind of makes it not just, I don't know, not just rice, (laughs) but it's really good, really easy. Um, Sometimes we'll just make refried beans and have just rice and beans for dinner. So um, yeah, that's my recipe for this week. That's awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much. Be sure to catch our next episode where we talk about unmet expectations in our birth plans and birth experiences, and then talk about some products that we couldn't live without and maybe some that we could. Uh, You can check us out on our website, partonthemess.com, social media, and Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Part on the Mess. And of course, if you like our content, you can check out bonus content like we have um, had a lot of today. And thanks for listening and Part on the Mess. We're making memories. <laughs>